In the last episode, we finally turned to the north to see the early rise of Date Masamune, who would succeed his father at the head of the clan, and quickly be forced to contend with a wide array of hostile neighbors. Surviving just narrowly, Masamune would live on to continue leading the Date clan into the waning years of the period. However, now we move back to the larger developments occurring in central Japan, as Hashiba Hideyoshi, at the head of the strongest power in the entire country, will soon come to clash with his old ally, Tokugawa Ieyasu. By the year 1584, a new normal was beginning to settle in. The aftershocks from the death of Oda Nobunaga were finally quieting down, and after two massive clashes over the future of the central regime that was once ruled by the Oda, a successor had finally risen. The most powerful name in the entire country was now Hashiba Hideyoshi a skilled leader who had firmly established himself as a key figure not only atop the remains of the former Oda regime, but also as a skilled politician whose influence could be felt deep within the capital city Kyoto. Shortly after taking over, Hideyoshi took to constructing his new power base, a central hub within close proximity to Kyoto where he could continue to dominate the clan and work to expand his influence, bringing to heel all those who still stood to oppose his will. This new citadel of his would be constructed atop the remains of Ishiyama Onganji, formerly the most fortified temple in all of Japan, a place that had previously endured a 10 year long siege, now would forever come to be known as Osaka Castle. Largely inspired by Azuchi, the grand palace built by Oda Nobunaga, Hideyoshi's predecessor, Osaka would follow the design of the new modern samurai fortress, yet succeed the former castle in every possible way. Hideyoshi's dream was for Osaka to become the most magnificent structure and beacon of might in the entire country, from which he and his family could rule Japan for generations. However, for as great as Hideyoshi and the power he commanded was becoming, Japan was still divided and at war with itself. The Sengoku Jidai was a wildfire that still gripped the nation. And as secure as his position currently was, we can still see he had one hurdle yet to overcome. One ghost from his past that was still haunting his present. Tokugawa Ieyasu, a former comrade of Hideyoshi, who had fought alongside him while they had both previously been in service to Oda Nobunaga. The death of Nobunaga, as we have previously seen, has come to drastically shake the balance of power within the country, with many former key Oda retainers having fallen against Hideyoshi at Yamazaki and Shizugatake, two victories that had led Hideyoshi into his current place of might. Yet Nobunaga's death also had many other effects outside of the Oda clan itself, the independence of those who were previously loyal. This is where we can see Ieyasu's rise truly begin. Although the Tokugawa clan had technically only been allied to the Oda, Nobunaga's rise had led to Ieyasu becoming merely a subordinate to his cause. Now, unshackled by the restraints previously placed on him while in service to the Oda, Ieyasu had drastically expanded his influence in a very short amount of time, seizing the provinces of Kai and Shinano following his lord's death. We can see that Ieyasu now commanded more power than the Takeda had while they had been at their height under Shingen. Indeed, the Tokugawa had grown to become one of the strongest clans east of the capital only being rivaled by the Hojo, to whom Ieyasu had brokered an alliance with through marriage. Ieyasu had always been an ambitious figure, yet he was also gifted with great patience, no doubt a feat he acquired in his youth 
when he lived as a hostage of other lords. The boy had become a man, and the circle had become full. Others at the time may not have been able to ever see his aspirations, yet here, looking back into the past, we can easily see the steps he took to grow his own status and become one of the greatest powers in the country. We know he wished to one day seize the land for himself. However, the path towards that great dream remained shrouded. His hour of destiny had yet to present itself. With both Hideyoshi and Ieyasu being such strong influences, a confrontation was bound to arise at some point, and by 1584, that point had come. For the third year in a row, Hideyoshi would be forced into battle against a man he had formerly called his friend and ally. It all started quickly following the Battle of Shizugatake, when Hideyoshi, wishing to ensure the stability of his new domain, invited many of the daimyo under his influence to come and swear renewed loyalty to him at Osaka. This action cannot be seen as anything out of the ordinary. Yet, what became a bold move was when he invited Oda Nobukatsu to Osaka to pay homage to him as well. Nobukatsu was one of the last living sons of Nobunaga. After his brother Nobutada died during the incident at Honoji and his brother Nobutaka had killed himself following the defeat at Shizugatake. Although it had already been established at the Kyosu conference that the child Samboshi was to become the new head of the clan, Nobukatsu was largely seen as one of the last leading figures of the Oda, ruling over Owari, the ancestral homeland of his family, and also holding a significant portion of territory in Ise and other areas throughout central Honshu. In his mind, the legacy and power his father Nobunaga had established still belonged to his bloodline, but it was clear Hideyoshi now challenged that very idea. Inviting Nobukatsu to Osaka was no doubt an action to reverse the roles of these two families. As if Nobukatsu bowed before Hideyoshi, the role of the Oda would diminish, and the Hashiba would truly take center stage. This was a political usurping of power. Because Hideyoshi's intentions were so obvious, Nobukatsu refused the invitation immediately putting him at odds with the man who had once championed his cause and family. Following this, Nobukatsu then turned to the one person who had the ability to stand firm against Hideyoshi, Tokugawa Ieyasu, who agreed to aid the Oda as a show of loyalty to the clan he once worked alongside. Of course, in retrospect, we can see this as a clear move by Ieyasu to further advance his position and status. Yet at the time, using the concept of championing the Oda worked for legitimate purposes. As we have already seen, it was a facade Hideyoshi had become accustomed to using. This would be the greatest gamble Ieyasu had ever taken, more so than anything else. Facing off against the sheer power Hideyoshi commanded, had the potential to eradicate the Tokugawa if things fell apart. Yet if victory could be secured, it could materialize that hour of destiny Ieyasu had been searching for, that moment in which he could finally rise to his full potential. For Hideyoshi, a clash with Ieyasu stood to be his toughest test yet, as Ieyasu commanded more might than any of his previous rivals. A new conflict was appearing on the horizon between these two great powers, and quickly both began to move to secure allies for the war to come, each of them knowing full well they could not defeat each other alone. Hideyoshi's sphere of influence was strong, incorporating not only the Mori into his faction, but also, more recently, the Uesugi. On top of that, the samurai under his command were extremely loyal. In fact, banking on this knowledge, he reached out to three prominent figures serving under Nobukatsu, an act that Nobukatsu quickly caught wind of and sentenced those men to death. Hideyoshi even sent word to Ieyasu in aims to sway him away from the Oda, guaranteeing him ownership over Owari and Mino if he simply switched sides. However, Ieyasu remained resolute 
refusing Hideyoshi's generous offer and maintaining his word to the Oda. To combat the Hashiba faction, Ieyasu also attempted to break Hideyoshi's grip over the West, sending word to Mori Teremoto in aims to hopefully have him attack Hideyoshi from the rear. This attempt did not pay off, however, as Teremoto simply dismissed the idea. What finally broke the tension and began the full military action was in March of 1584, when forces loyal to Hideyoshi marched into Iga and seized Ueno Castle, which had been under the rule of the Oda. Quickly following this in April, Hideyoshi himself mobilized his own forces and began a two-pronged assault against Nobukatsu and Ieyasu. The war had begun. Hideyoshi had made the first move. The first campaign was to be to the south, where he dispatched forces into Ise to deal with threats from the Oda who were gathering in preparation for the coming conflict. Although now dug in, Hideyoshi's armies were unable to dislodge Nobukatsu's forces. Thus, several sieges began across the province. This prompted Ieyasu to finally move in aims to aid the Oda defenders in Ise, bringing up an army through Owari. He was forced to come to an abrupt halt when he learned that Hideyoshi had begun a second campaign swinging down into Owari from Mino. Hideyoshi was able to do this by securing the support of two local lords within Mino, Ikeda Tsuneoki and his son-in-law, Mori Nagayoshi, who I should mention was of no relation to the Mori clan of the West. Tsuneoki and Nagayoshi had actually previously been approached for aid by Nobukatsu, Yet one word came from Hideyoshi who promised them ownership over all of Mino and Owari, the same offer Ieyasu had turned down. They eagerly took his side instead. Armies under the command of both of the Mino lords quickly began pouring over into Owari, leading to Tsuneoki's forces securing Inuyama Castle on the border between the two provinces, while forces under Nagayoshi moved down to take Haguro Castle an important fortification on the road to Nobukatsu's stronghold at Kyosu, which boldly enough it seems was Nagayoshi's next target. While en route, his forces would camp at a location known as Hashimanbayashi, unaware that Ieyasu was now hastily making his own way up to halt the advance. It was here Ieyasu established himself at a position known as Komakiyama, where the remains of a rundown fort already sat, with his army secure and with proper knowledge of Nagayoshi's location, several of Ieyasu's commanders requested permission to assault his encampment, to which Ieyasu agreed. At dawn the following day, Tokugawa soldiers stormed Nagayoshi's location, catching his forces completely off guard and causing a mass rout, as Nagayoshi himself retreated back to Haguro. Angered at his son-in-law's failure, Ikeda Tsuneyoki took matters into his own hands and dispatched an additional 3,000 soldiers to aid Nagayoshi. In response, Ieyasu deployed another contingent to intercept the Ikeda forces. However, this time he wasn't so lucky, and the Ikeda army avoided detection by the Tokugawa and made it to Haguro safely. This would prompt Ieyasu to further fortify his position at Komaki restoring the old fort and building further walls of palisades and digging deep surrounding trenches. He also ordered the reconstruction of two more castles nearby to further bolster his defensive network. As the Tokugawa line became stronger and stronger within Owari, Hideyoshi finally arrived on the scene to lead his army personally. Arriving at Tsuneoki's location at Inuyama on the 7th of May, Hideyoshi's intent was to clash with Ieyasu in a decisive battle. Not wishing to charge foolishly into Ieyasu's defensive position at Komaki, Hideyoshi would go on to build up an even more impressive line of fortifications while setting up his own headquarters at a position known as Gakudin. Linking together strongholds with palisades, he created what is often referred to as a greater version of the palisade line seen at Nagashino. We can estimate by this point that Hideyoshi was fielding a force somewhere around 40,000 strong, while Ieyasu on the other hand, linking together with Nobukatsu's soldiers, had a force around 18,000 strong. Yet although Hideyoshi's numbers more than doubled Ieyasu's, he would refuse to budge. 
In fact, neither of them would, having both been at the Battle of Nagashino nine years prior. They each knew what a full-scale assault on a fortified palisade line looked like, as matchlock fire would easily tear through any attack. Thus, a long stalemate set in, as both sides just sat and waited. Finally, after what many assume was out of sheer boredom, Ikeda Tsuneoki came to Hideyoshi with a plan to dislodge Ieyasu. Being that Ieyasu had taken much of his forces with him, leaving his own territory unguarded, he suggested that Hideyoshi should allow him to take a detachment to swing around the Tokugawa lines and attack into Mikawa. This would force Ieyasu into sending a portion of his own army after him and weaken the Tokugawa line, allowing Hideyoshi to easily sweep over his position and break through Komaki. Hideyoshi agreed to the plot. If utter secrecy was maintained, it had a strong chance of success. However, Hideyoshi also warned Tsuneoki not to push too deep, as doing so would weaken their actions as a whole. With consent given, Tsuneoki, along with Nagayoshi and several other commanders, headed out at midnight with a force of 20,000, making their way south around Ieyasu's position. They had thought they had completely evaded all detection, yet soon, Farmers, of all people, reported to Ieyasu the movements of Tsuneoki. Initially, Ieyasu refused to believe them, thinking their words to be some form of trick from Hideyoshi. Yet, when scouts returned and confirmed the story, Ieyasu had to act fast. Leaving only 6,500 men at Komaki, Ieyasu took the remainder of his and the Oda soldiers and quickly set off after Tsuneoki. By this point, the Tokugawa castle of Iwasaki had already fallen to Tsuneoki, whose own forces were at this time becoming somewhat detached from one another, strung out along the road as they marched. They were so far strung out that Tsuneoki's rearguard were engaged by Ieyasu's army while they were still eating breakfast. Hearing the sounds of matchlock fire in the distance and realizing what was occurring, several of Tsuneoki's divisions quickly redeployed to the nearby village of Nakakute, where they found a nice defensible ridge to take up position. As Tokugawa soldiers advanced up to the enemy at Nakakute, Tsuneoki's forces rained bullets into their advance, driving off the Tokugawa attack. However, it was then revealed that Ieyasu had arrived on the field at the head of the Tokugawa main body. This was somewhat unexpected, as no one thought Ieyasu would actually abandon his position at Komaki and strike back with such a large force. Quickly, word was sent to Ikeda Tsuneoki himself, who was still at Iwasaki Castle. Upon hearing the news, he and Mori Nagayoshi rushed to Nakakute, where they recomposed their army. Although Tsuneyuki still possessed greater numbers, the size of both forces were still close. Thus, a hard-fought clash was soon to come. The second phase of the Battle of Nagakute began around 9 o'clock in the morning, as Ieyasu ordered his matchlock soldiers to advance and fire upon enemy positions. As both sides began to open up on one another, two of Tsuneoki's sons attempted to break through the Tokugawa lines. This resulted in their charge against I Naomasa, a Tokugawa retainer who will in time earn a legendary reputation. Naomasa absorbed the brunt of their attacks and managed to hold off the sons long enough for his soldiers to rout them with repeated volleys from their arquebus guns. It is said that even Tsuneoki attempted to aid them, yet was unable to break Naomasa's line. On the other side of the field, Mori Nagayoshi was waiting in anticipation for Ieyasu to make a move on the left wing. Yet, he was caught completely off guard when Ieyasu ordered his whole contingent to charge in two sections. Crashing into Nagayoshi's forces, his soldiers became disoriented as chaos began to spread. In aims to rally his men to hold the line, Nagayoshi quickly rode back and forth, yelling and waving his war fan, easily sticking out on the battlefield. Noticing him, a Tokugawa Ashigaru armed with a matchlock carefully took aim and sent a bullet straight through his skull. This very public death caused the left wing to almost completely collapse, followed after by Oda Nobukatsu who led his forces around and began another assault from the rear. With things now drastically falling apart for Tsuneoki, he slumped over in despair, allowing a young Tokugawa samurai to charge at his position and claim his head. Ieyasu had won at Nagakute, and even more impressively, he had done so with extremely minimal casualties. 
Immediately, a messenger rushed back to Hideyoshi and relayed the news of the defeat at Nakakute, which caused him to rapidly set off with reinforcements. If Hideyoshi was able to catch Ieyasu now in the field, it would mean doom for the outnumbered Tokugawa. Yet as soon as he began to move, heroically, the veteran and respected Tokugawa commander, Honda Tarakatsu, rode out with a small force and began to threaten Hideyoshi's rear. Easily, Hideyoshi could have fallen on him and crushed this legendary figure. Yet instead, he was taken aback by Tarakatsu's bravery, and instead declined to attack. This moment of stalling was all that was needed for Ieyasu to return to a position of safety once again, resulting in a renewed period of stalemate. A period that went on and on as both sides continued to sit behind their palisade lines once again, refusing to move. Finally, Ora Nobukatsu began to crack under the pressure from this prolonged conflict and went behind Ieyasu's back to sue for peace with Hideyoshi a submission that would cause the Oda to essentially lose all authority. This is a somewhat anticlimactic decision, which left both Ieyasu and Hideyoshi with no more cause to fight. Thus, both forces simply withdrew from Owari. This brings about the interesting ending to events that sees defeat really only fall upon Oda Nobukatsu and not Ieyasu, as Ieyasu himself, having won the major clashes against Hideyoshi, stood his ground and somehow still came out of this whole situation being called a victor. Of course, Hideyoshi got his way too. Although technically losing the conflict at Komaki and Nagakute, he would still ultimately get Nobukatsu to submit to him. The chess match between the Hashiba and Tokugawa was over, and perhaps both of them had found a new respect for each other, realizing what the outcome would be if they were to formally go to war. For Ieyasu, he would never be able to hold out forever against the might of Hideyoshi, yet Hideyoshi also came to realize that fighting Ieyasu would be an extremely deadly affair. Of course, they still remained wary of one another, as each posed a unique threat to each other's existence. Yet something still needed to be done to end this dangerous turmoil between the two. Following the clash at Komaki and Nagakute, a series of arrangements were made that included castle transfers, hostage transfers, and even adoptions. It was clear that both clans decided it would be more mutually beneficial to try and coexist, as they now were linked closer together than ever before. It wouldn't be until two years later, in 1586, when Ieyasu finally came fully under Hideyoshi's sphere of influence, cemented not only by Ieyasu traveling to Osaka to swear his allegiance, but also the marriage of Hideyoshi's sister to Ieyasu himself. So, what can we learn from all of this? By 1584, Hashiba Hideyoshi sat atop the greatest power in the country, Yet internally, he still had concerns about his clan's stability. Calling forth his many lords to come and pledge renewed allegiance to him, Oda Nobukatsu would decline, as doing so would delegitimize the old authority of the Oda. This prompted Nobukatsu to seek the aid of Tokugawa Ieyasu, who took his side and stood firmly against Hashiba Hideyoshi in what was to be remembered as the Battle of Komaki Nagakute, a chess match between Hideyoshi and Ieyasu that would result in several large clashes that Ieyasu ultimately came out the victor of. However, even though Ieyasu was able to hold off Hideyoshi on the field, Nobukatsu would in time lose his cool and submit to the Hashiba. Following the larger conflict, Hideyoshi and Ieyasu would further link their two mighty clans together, until finally in 1586, Ieyasu would formally pledge his loyalty to Hideyoshi. In the next episode, with the situation to the east now at a stable point, Hashiba Hideyoshi will turn his attention west. Looking to secure the islands, he will first come to launch a campaign to seize Shikoku. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.